Hi everyone, welcome to my talk called Brain Training at the Zoo. So I hear that a number of people across the world are planning on tuning into this talk live on Facebook or Zoom or are planning to watch it afterwards um, depending on time zones uh, pre-recorded on Facebook or our YouTube channel. Um, so welcome to everyone and because I have such a diversity of people that I believe are going to be interested in this talk I'm going to try and cover um, a broad range of topics so that there's something interesting for everyone. Um, but essentially what I'm going to do is explain some of the research that I have been doing and what it's like to be a zoo scientist. If our paths haven't crossed already, I'm a zoo animal uh, welfare and behaviour scientist and I've been working for Bristol Zoological Society for the past eight years. Bristol Zoological Society owns and operates two zoos in Bristol. Uh, we have Bristol Zoo Gardens, which is our original Victorian urban zoo, which is around about 12 acres in size. This is where our flagship uh, species, the gorillas, live. And then we have Wild Place Project, which is our larger zoo, but it's younger. So it opened in 2013. This is where we keep our larger animals, but we also house a lot of our lemurs. So in my opinion, I have one of the best and most interesting jobs in the world. I get to develop and run experiments on zoo animals at both Bristol Zoo and Wild Place. And before this, I did so for my PhD and before that in a number of other zoos around the world. Um, so this talk is going to feature stories from primarily um, Bristol Zoological Society zoos, but also a couple of other places that I've worked. And I'm going to try and tell you a couple of interesting things, such as how we discovered that gorillas can do magic and how we realised that the lemurs that we have aren't as stupid as we thought they were. So I'm going to chuck in a couple of bonus stories for you too, but the two main stories that I'm going to cover uh, today are Gorilla Game Lab and Lima Boot Camp. So I'm actually going to start off with a story from childhood um, and one of my favourite games when I was uh, growing up. I wonder how many of you remember this game. Um, this is something called the, the Tomy Waterfall and it was a, a game that was around in the 80s. So if you're a child of the 80s like me, you might remember this one. Um, and essentially what you had to do was press that white circular button there, or sometimes they had two buttons. And pressing the button created a, a, a water current inside the, the game and the water current would move uh, little pieces, little play pieces like rings inside that would hit targets. This particular model here is called the Tomy Ring Toss and you had to um, manoeuvre the rings onto pegs um, and that apparently was how you won the game. And I was inspired to, to think of a game of my own that meant something to me after visiting an exhibition in London called the Playwell Exhibition, which was um, held at the Welcome Collection um, in March this year, right before we went into lockdown. And the exhibition was fascinating. It was all about the impact of play on our daily lives and our permanent lives as well and just how important it is to play for your well-being and also your cognition and there were games in there throughout the decades that have been dissected and showed the different cognitive skills that they would challenge and how that linked to your welfare when you played them and the urge to play, the motivation to play is so strong that the exhibition also had a selection of toys that had been made by refugee children um, out of rubbish, um, which was just really fascinating. Um, so I'm sure you all have an idea in your head as to a toy that meant something to you and that was important to you and you can remember how it challenged you and how that made you feel. So whether you've got a penchant for puzzles or a craving for a crossword, whatever it is, try and visualise something now in your mind's eye as we move through the next couple of slides that I want to show you. 
So with that in mind, um, what do these human games have to do with non-human animals? Well, if you didn't know this about me already, um, I design and evaluate large scale games for zoo animals. And my research is based on the connections between behaviour, cognition and welfare. And actually, I use the abbreviation ABC to refer to those things. So I'm going to try and explain those to you now. So A stands for affect. Affect is another word for your feelings and feelings um, are essentially your welfare. So this is just another um, abbreviation for, for welfare, basically. Welfare is how you feel or animal welfare is how an animal feels. Then we have B, which stands for behaviour. Behaviour is how you act or interact. And then C stands for cognition. Cognition is a tricky thing to define, but essentially cognition is your mental capacities and how you think. Now, because all of that is going on in the brain, we can't actually see cognition. Uh, but what we can see is behaviour. So if we can observe behaviour, either the behaviour of other humans or the behaviour of animals, we can make inferences about cognition and cognitive skills from that behaviour. And similarly, we can do that with welfare as well. So we can observe behaviour and make inferences about how an animal feels from that behaviour. So if we just apply that to my game of choice again, um, what we have here is um, the feelings of frustration. In my case, um, I used to get really frustrated at this game because the pieces inside would seemingly move at random and didn't seem to follow any logic. It would defy gravity all the time. And I think I ended up breaking this game at some point because it was so frustrating. But I also obviously enjoyed it as well because I played it a lot. Um, so the behaviour is actually how I was operating or playing the game, uh, the physical things, but also indirect things like maybe me shouting in frustration or banging my fist on the table. So I can self report to you and say, OK, this is how I felt when I played this game. But obviously, if we have an animal equivalent to a game, so here is an example of a game for uh, gorillas. The gorillas can't directly tell us how they feel when they're playing this game. So we have to use their behavioural responses to infer how they're feeling. And similarly, with their cognition, um, we can watch how they perform if they get better over time, if we can isolate a particular cognitive skill and see if them using the game and getting to a certain level would demonstrate that they have that skill that can be useful or if that skill changes over time through repeated playing of the device. So just to carry on with a bit of theory now, um, just to tell you in really broad strokes what we know already about the interconnections between A, B and C. So the first thing is that animals seek challenge. We know that many animals in captivity and in the wild are strongly motivated to seek out and to perform challenges. Um, and I use the word challenge here as a sort of um, alternative to using what we would refer to as a game in human psychology. In the animal world, we tend to call it a challenge. Then we have the fact that many animals will work for free. So you may be familiar with the term contra freeloading, which is where um, animals may work at a puzzle or a challenge, a game, whatever you want to call it, to obtain a food reward when that same food reward is simultaneously available for free. So rather than going for the free option, the free meal, they will work to get the, um, the meal instead. Um, and my own research on chimpanzees and dolphins before working at Bristol has definitely shown a relative preference for working for a, for a food reward or a, a, a play item rather than um, just having the free option. So there's something there about the challenge in itself being rewarding. 
Then we have something called the Eureka effect. This is also known as the aha moment. And this is the phenomenon where we know that at the point in which an animal solves a problem spontaneously, so it's arrived at the solution to a problem, a challenge, a game, um, that moment is inherently enriching and it's associated with really positive feelings. Um, so being able to solve something and work it out for yourself is inherently good for you. Then we have the fact that um, living in a challenging environment or having challenges put into your environment can actually delay your rate of uh, dementia. So while it can't stop you from getting dementia, dementia being uh, cog cognitive decline, so um, a loss of cognitive ability over time, it can't prevent it. Sorry, it can prevent it. It can't stop it. What it can do if you live in an enriched environment, a challenging environment, is slow down the rate of onset of dementia or cognitive decline. Then we know that choices and control are very important for animals' welfare, their well-being, um, giving animals the opportunity to choose what they have in their environment or choose what they work for is associated with feeling good. And then finally, providing challenges to captive animals is a real balancing act and it's a very difficult thing to achieve well because you've got to balance um, the animal's evolved cognitive skills, what they're motivated by, so is that food, is that companionship, is that play, with um, the skill of the actual thing that you're giving them. So can you balance the level of challenge in the game with the level of skill and motivation that the animal possesses? And that's certainly easier said than done. I'm really proud that uh, Bristol Zoological Society have been so highly involved in the ABC field in terms of um, doing it in zoo animals for the past eight years. And this is really based on a continuation of my PhD research, um, an establishment of the two long term projects that I do at the zoo, which I'm going to talk to you about today, and also num numerous student projects that uh, we supervise as well. So I've just put some examples up here of some of our activities, some of our papers. I always think that zoo animals are such precious commodities that if you have the resources in your zoo to be able to do this type of research, then you really should. Um, and it's your responsibility, I think, to do as much research that you can that's not only going to benefit um, the welfare of your animals by understanding them better, but benefit other zoo animals as well. And you can do that by disseminating your findings, whether that's a public talk, um, a conference with a small number of other zoos or um, a scientific publication. I should probably um, give you a definition of cognitive enrichment because you will have seen it written on the previous slide in a couple of places. So cognitive enrichment is a task which challenges an animal's evolved cognitive skills and doing that task is associated with one or more validated indicators of well-being. Another easier way of saying that is that if an animal um, is engaged in a task that is using its cognitive skills and doing so is associated with positive feelings, then that by definition is a piece of cognitive enrichment. So back to a tale of two stories. Um, so without further ado, now I've armed you with all of that theory. Let me tell you about the two ABC projects that we've been running here at Bristol Zoological Society for the past five or so years. So both of these projects are on primates, but that's OK um, because Sir David Attenborough himself said in a recent interview that he thinks that primates are the best. Um, but it, it should be said, let me tell you that ABC research isn't just a primate specific field. Um, you can apply it to any animal, um, but it just so happens that we've done a lot of work on primates at Bristol Zoological Society because that tends to be what we specialise in as zoos. And we did actually have some bird research planned that was really excited, 
um, but we had to cancel it due to coronavirus, um, so that's a shame. So um, let's start with Gorilla Game Lab then. So as I stated at the beginning, um, the gorillas at Bristol Zoo are our flagship species and we have a family troop of um, eight gorillas at Bristol Zoo currently ranging in age from one month to 37 years. Um, and they're just fascinating and brilliant to study. And the reason we set up um, a project on the gorillas was that we felt that while they have an amazingly complex and rich social life, um, because we have excellent um, breeding record at Bristol Zoo and so that doesn't need changing in any aspect. We did feel like the gorillas could benefit with some more activities to do when they're in their indoor enclosure and then they're more by themselves. So we wanted to occupy their time but also occupy their brains. Um, so that's what this project set out to do. Gorilla Game Lab is a collaboration between Bristol Zoological Society and the University of Bristol, who um, exceptionally funded this research. And I'm so, so thankful to them because without the money, we wouldn't have been able to manage to do it so well. Um, so here are my collaborators and we've got from left to right, um, Dr. Stuart Gray from engineering. We have Dr. Katie Burgess, from um, experimental psychology, then me, and then Dr. Peter Bennett from computer science. Um, so as a team together, we decided that we wanted to do an ABC project that weaved in um, high technology because of our um, interests and our expertise. And I was so excited because all of the um, games that I've made for zoo animals up until this point have been really low tech, really low budget. I've used things that I found in skips in people's gardens from garden centres, things that were donated. Um, but if we go back to my childhood toy, uh, the Tommy Waterfall again, if you think about how that must have been meticulously designed, prototyped, market tested, I think to get a good toy, um, you really need to think about using those same design processes um, for zoo animals as well. So that's what we tried to do with this. The aims of Gorilla Game Lab were to design a new game product and we wanted that game product to challenge physical cognitive skills of our gorillas, occupy their time, um, specifically when they're indoors, not up to much in the day, produce positive experiences, so to produce a more positive welfare state in the gorillas when they're engaging with it. And we wanted to produce a product that could evaluate itself. So typically when we do studies like this, where we give animals enrichment objects or apparatus, the amount of hours and manpower that go into recording data, then coding it, um, analyzing it, evaluating it, it, it's a lot of work. So we were looking to see whether we could use technological advances to do the hard work for us. So our research process um, is sort of summarised on this slide here. So we began with really extensive background research into gorilla cognition, gorilla welfare, um, gorilla behaviour, so your ABCs, what we knew about those things already. Um, we interviewed the keepers to ask them what they felt the gorillas would benefit from and what their motivations were likely to be. We consulted experts in um, product design and we eventually created this new game, um, which then went through two full rounds of testing with the Bristol Zoo gorillas. And here it is, um, and I hope you can get a sense of what it is from just a small 2D picture. And I will admit this thing is quite difficult to explain and I'm likely to miss something out, so do forgive me. But essentially what this is, is a modular meta maze, um, which is a fancy way of saying that it's one maze um, that contains 12 smaller mazes within one big frame. and all those modules, all of those individual um, square shapes can actually be rotated around inside the frame. And 
not only their positions in the frame, but also their orientation. So you can rotate them um, so that they're at different angles and you can change the positioning of the shelves inside and the dials and everything. And when you do so, you have a staggering 479 million possible arrangements inside this thing. So the chances of the gorillas ever encountering the same maze twice is it's basically zero. So the aim of this thing is the hardest for me to explain. Um, but what you have is um, nuts, which is their preferred food reward. The gorillas love monkey nuts. So you load those into the top of the device and then a gorilla uses its finger or a stick tool and pokes that finger or stick tool through the acrylic sheet on the front of the device. And they use that finger or stick tool to manoeuvre the nut through the modules from left to right or top to bottom. Um, and eventually the nuts are released and freed from exit hatches at the bottom of the device. Um, we designed the whole thing in CAD and then had it laser cut from um, sustainable wood. And the brilliant thing about this is that those pieces are, come flat pack and it takes minutes to assemble um, just by slotting the different pieces together. And um, you can do so without needing any glue or metal fixtures and fittings. The only me metal um, fixture that we had was a very small magnet on the back of the device um, just to stop the door from um, opening and closing in a draft. So that was really cool. So hopefully I've explained what um, the game looks like um, sufficiently there. My favourite part of Gorilla Game Lab is the fact that we were so interested in incorporating technology into this thing. So here we have um, a list of um, the top part of the list is the technology that we eventually settled on using. And then the bottom part of the list are um, the technological aspects, which we um, did some research on and trialled a little bit. And we decided not to use them either because they were impractical or they didn't suit um, our approach and the way we wanted to do things. So just to summarise, um, we decided to use piezo sensors. Um, so piezo sensors are tiny little metal discs that look, look, look a little bit like a coin, but they're actually much thinner than a coin. And we implanted these at various points inside the device, inside each module. And when movement or um, air pressure changes occur over the top of these sensors, um, that's picked up as an electric current. And what that essentially does is it tracks the movement of the gorilla's fingers and the stick tools and the nuts inside the module so that you get a, a very big data set very quickly of how the gorillas are using the device or the game, sorry, and their progress through moving the nuts. We um, tried a bit of object tracking, so we, we, were, we were interested to see if we could use if we could write a computer program to track the movement, the free movement of gorillas around their enclosure. And then what we settled on doing instead was using object recognition. So we used footage from inside the device and outside the device to capture shots of the gorillas faces. And then we used a machine learning program to recognize um, the gorillas as individuals so that then we could um, log basically which gorilla was using the device and and when. So moving on to the results then, um, I could spend just an hour talking about these, but obviously I don't have that long, so I'm going to have to whiz through them and just give you a flavour of what we found. And I'm not going to use any stats or graphs in this presentation because I want it to be um, accessible to everyone. So what did we find? Um, we were able to set up the Gorilla Game Lab in the Gorilla enclosure in their indoor area for two study periods. And each of those study periods was a couple of um, months long. So a good long time that we had to evaluate the game. And here are just some screenshots of the gorillas using the device. And these screenshots are taken from 
um, a camera inside the device looking out and also a camera placed at 90 degrees to the gorilla using it. And both of these cameras were able to uh, record images that the machine learning program recognized. What you can see from these pictures is that the gorillas, well, they used stick tools. So that was um, something that they did themselves. We uh, didn't specifically provide them with any tools. They went off, found their own sticks, um, manipulated the sticks in their mouths to create the correct size and sharpness and use them um, spontaneously. The gorillas also used the device by themselves, other than when it was a mother with a young baby. And the only gorilla um, out of the troop who didn't use the device was our silverback male. And we think the reason that happened was because the silverback has a very important role in the group. He's there to protect the ladies and to keep an eye out. And just because of where we positioned the device, I think if the silverback male had have gone up to the device and um, interacted with it, his back would have been to the rest of the troop. And just for that pure reason, it probably wasn't very attractive for him to do that and have his back turned to everything else going on. We didn't see any habituation over the course of the, the two study periods, um, with the gorillas continuing to take it in turns very patiently, um, very calmly um, to use the device over a period of many months. Now, I hinted at the beginning of the talk something about gorillas and magic. So what we found was that some of the modules were pretty tricky. They were pretty complex. And I've put examples on the slide of some of the ones that the gorillas found the most complicated to interact with. And the common thing here is that they have um, anti-gravity aspect to them or some sort of barrier or some sort of thing where the nut disappears. Um, temporarily. But the gorillas seem to take these magic tricks in their stride. And in fact, the older gorillas in the troop preferentially used the more complex modules. It was only the two infants that preferentially used the uh, easier modules, if you like. Um, even though the complicated modules often yielded very little reward because they were so complicated, the gorillas couldn't figure out how to get the nuts out, they were still very engaging to the gorillas. Interestingly, only three gorillas um, could use stick tools, and those gorillas were the only gorillas who were able to extract nuts from the device. But the other gorillas still consistently used it over many months. So this kind of all in connection shows us that the ability to extract the food reward was not particularly rewarding to the gorillas. It wasn't their number one priority. And in fact, one gorilla who was able to um, extract nuts from the device just made a pile of the nuts as if to say, oh, yeah, maybe I'll eat those later rather than gobbling them up straight away. So we found that really interesting. In combination, the piezo sensors and the machine learning program allowed us to collect real time data, big data sets that told us a lot about individual animal engagement and problem solving and learning as well over time. In the top pictures here, we have just screenshots of how the machine learning program was able to detect Jock and Toonie. And paired with the piezo sensors, we would get an output to say, yep, Jock definitely doesn't use the device, but he approaches quite close, whereas Toonie is a real game player. Um, so then we used what's known as the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is essentially the game and the sensors inside the game and the cameras and the machine learning program all connected together in a network and they send their information in real time to a website. And what this provides is the keepers an immediate um, summary of how that game is being used without us having to watch the gorillas ourselves at all. Um, so you might expect to get an output um, on the keeper iPad that says something like, Toonie used the game for 15 minutes today and her favourite module was D. 
And such information is really valuable for keepers because it allows them to keep track of how well that game or that piece of enrichment is operating for the gorillas. If some gorillas never use it, if some gorillas are getting frustrated by it, if the modules need switching up or switching out, um, because Keepers and researchers as well just don't have the time to stand there all day collecting this data. So if we can collect it automatically, that's absolutely fantastic. And this isn't actually the only one of Bristol Zoological Society's projects that has machine learning as part of it. If you were um, lucky enough to catch um, Dr. Caspian Johnson's talk, which was last month on our Cordofan Giraffe project, you'll know that um, we have a conservation project out in Africa where we're trying to use drones um, to monitor giraffe populations and to do a census or to, to count how many giraffe there are. And um, again, in collaboration with the University of Bristol, we're hoping that we can use machine learning to recognise individual giraffes um, if the computer can learn um, their individual um, markings on their on their bodies, their spot patterns. So this is the end of my first big story um, on Gorilla Game Lab, but it's certainly not the end of Gorilla Game Lab. Um, Gorilla Game Lab is currently postponed. Um, it's on ice um, due to coronavirus lockdown. But having this really long lockdown um, has allowed the team and I to really think about the project, to reflect on it and to think about what we might want to do in future. And I think the consensus is, is that we really think that this technology has really important implications, not only for the gorillas um, in the future, but also other animals that we have in the zoo that we just can't watch all the time. If we can develop these technologies a little bit more, I think that's going to have real value to the ABC research that we do um, here at Bristol Zoological Society. Before I move on to my second Bristol Zoo story, um, I'd love to tell you a little bit about um, just a quick bonus story on some dolphins that I worked on for my PhD at a facility in California. Um, so I did my PhD on dolphin and chimpanzee cognition and welfare. And I developed a giant underwater maze, um, it's a labyrinth maze for them. And strangely, this had a lot of similarities to the to the childhood toy that I was talking about at, at the beginning of the uh, presentation. And I don't know whether that was subconscious or not, but um, it's very similar. It's sort of the dolphin equivalent to that. Um, but what really resonated with me after doing this project was the impact of physical movement exercise on animal well-being. Even for an animal like a dolphin that has to move continually, they even move when they're sleeping. You can't um, overestimate the importance of movement and its connection to welfare. Even laboratory studies on um, rats have shown us that exercise perfuses or washes the brain with blood. So it actually enhances your cognition to move rather than to be static. And so to get the best out of games for zoo animals, I think we need to think more in future about tying in a physical component. And this is particularly important for zoo animals because they may be moving considerably less than they would be in the wild. So let's move on from one grey squeaky animal to another. Um, this is back at Wild Place Project. This is my main um, story number two, uh, Lima Boot Camp. So it's quite a different project to Gorilla Game Lab. Um, and the aim of this project was to find ways in which the cognitive skills of zoo housed lemurs or captive lemurs could be studied in a range of uh, different environments that they live in because there's no such thing as a typical zoo. You can have a real diversity of habitats that fall under the bracket of a zoo. So could we design something that could be applicable to many, many um, lemur groups in captivity? And to do this, we used the ring-tailed lemur troop at Wild Place as our model population, as well as an additional four troops of lemurs that were housed at the Lima Conservation Foundation, which is a facility in Florida that I was lucky enough to visit a couple of years ago. 
So as a little bit of background that I think is necessary, I just want to try and summarise in this slide how we go about studying animal cognition. So the first thing you need to do is to try and work out what cognitive skill or skills you're actually interested in measuring. So you want to know if an animal possesses a particular skill or at what level they have that skill. And there's two ways you can approach this. You can either do naturalistic observations, which is where you observe the animals in their normal environment and you don't interfere. You don't put anything in with them. You just see what they do. And in doing so, it can take a long time to try and detect if they have that particular skill because you have to be lucky enough to spontaneously see it. Or you can get a little bit more experimental and design a task to experimentally test if the animal has that skill. And that task is what we call um, in the field an apparatus. Or you could, I guess, um, as we've talked about earlier, call it a game but um, it's probably more correct to call it an apparatus. And by watching the animal's behaviour, either naturalistically or when they're using this apparatus, you can, as I said before, infer their cognitive skills from that. Well, that's all very straightforward and simple, you might think, but it's actually not, um, particularly in a zoo setting, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, zoos are renowned for having what I call experimental noise, which is just the, the fuss and the bother from um, unpredictable weather raining on your experiment, or obviously zoos have visitors, so visitors walking past while you've got an animal concentrating on something. Um, there can be really large variation between zoos, as I said before, and sometimes we find that traditional apparatus that you might use in a laboratory setting is just not practical for a zoo setting. So that really got us up to the point of thinking, OK, what can we do for lemurs? How can we design an apparatus that will uh, be valid for testing their cognition that's going to work in a number of zoo settings. So along comes Lima Boot Camp project. Uh, this project was very kindly crowdfunded, so we raised the money um, online over a one month period. So if you're watching this and you actually gave us some money for the Lima Boot Camp project, I'm eternally grateful. Um, so the initial aim of this project was, as I said, to design a piece of apparatus to test lemur cognition, more specifically foraging cognition, which is the cogn cognitive skills um, pertaining to accessing and acquiring food. So the boot camp um, part, I guess, in the lemur boot camp um, title refers to the fact that as a longer term goal, we were interested to see if we could train up cognitive skills that were lacking or absent in captive lemurs that we had um, identified in wild lemurs. Um, if you didn't know already, Bristol Zoological Society is world renowned for its um, wild lemur conservation that it does. So it, this is a perfect tie in between our field conservation projects and our zoo projects. So we were interested to see um, in this context, could we conserve cognitive skills? And what I mean by that is not conserving um, total numbers of lemurs, which would be your um, sort of traditional approach to conservation. It's conserving skills in them, in their brains um, that they're evolved to have. Lima Boot Camp, just like Gorilla Game Lab, is a team effort and um, it, there's a whole team of us working on this. Again, um, Dr. Katie Burgess from the University of Bristol School of Experimental Psychology is um, a collaborator on this project. She also works with me on the Gorilla Game Lab project. And we also have Dr. Lauren Highfill from Eckerd College in Florida and the Lima Conservation Foundation in Florida as well. And of course, um, all of the um, animal keeping staff um, at Wild Place as well, who helped me get my apparatus um, in and out with the lemurs.
This slide just shows you again um, an overview of our research project process. So very similar to Guerrilla Game Lab, um, you have these phases of designing things, testing them, evaluating them, then redesigning, re-evaluating, testing. So this takes us right up to coronavirus lockdown. Again, the project is sort of um, postponed for now, but it does intend to continue when things and life get back to normal. So um, I'm going to talk to you now about the key findings. So the first um, phase of Lima Boot Camp, and this is um, something that is very close to being published, we hope. Um, what we did here in the first phase were to provide the lemurs with a number of um, physical materials and also um, highly unusual um, novel food items that they probably hadn't come into contact with before to try and assess their general responses. So did the lemurs have preferences for certain materials? Were they um, repelled from certain textures? How did they use their hands and how did social testing, in other words, testing them as a group together, impact the ability for us to collect data? And knowing how animals respond to these materials, these whole foods and how they operate as a group was going to help us to design the most appropriate cognitive test apparatus that we could. And we found from these initial trials that lemurs have a real preference for natural materials. So they really hone in on wood. But the problem with using wood is that the lemurs would chew it up and spit it out. So we realised that we couldn't, as much as it would look nice and naturalistic, we couldn't develop a piece of apparatus out of wood because it just wouldn't last. Um, we also found that the lemurs investigated primarily using their, their noses, um, then their hands, and then finally their mouths. And all of the sniffing and the scent marking that went on really helped us to understand that our apparatus couldn't be strong smelling. It had to be um, something we could disinfect and clean to get rid of all their scent marks between trials. And it couldn't be too complicated to solve by hand because lemurs aren't particularly manually dexterous compared to other primates. We also found that the way in which lemurs used their hands was really um, impacted by their age. And because ring-tailed lemurs are such a flexible species that are just as comfortable eating above ground as below ground, we had to develop an apparatus that would accommodate plenty of jumping and climbing. So Christmas came early for the lemurs um, with this giant 24 door um, advent calendar. Um, so what this is, it's not a real advent calendar. Um, this is an artificial foraging patch. Um, so there are 24 chambers and each chamber has something behind. 12 or half of the chambers um, behind these doors have the scent of food, but no actual food. So what we did was take a piece of food in this case, the lemurs at Wild Place really love sweet potato. Um, we put the piece of food in the chamber, but we hid it behind a piece of mesh. So the scent was coming through, but the actual physical reward was not there. And then in the other 12 um, chambers, we put the piece of sweet potato that the lemurs could actually access. And then the the difference between reward and non-reward was reflected by a different cue. So just as an example, we could put all of the food rewards behind a red door and all of the non-food sort of trick doors um, behind a blue door. And what you can do here using this apparatus that's really flexible is test things like, can lemurs tell the difference between two color cues to textural cues? Can they remember the spatial location of food and so on and so forth? So this apparatus gives you the ability to test quite a number of cognitive skills. And as you can see, it was used at, at a group level. So we didn't test individual lemurs, we test them all together. Now, unfortunately, I can't say much more at this stage because our findings are being prepared for publication and so they're not suitable to put into a public talk just yet. But I can tell you that we think this apparatus is a really promising way of testing multiple lemur cognitive skills in a social setting.
one of the big perks of my um, profession is the travel. And I mentioned a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to go to the Lima Conservation Foundation on a bit of a recce to see if we could run some similar Lima Cog cognition projects out there. Um, unfortunately, a tropical storm came along um, a month earlier than it was meant to um, and literally washed out all of our plans to go and do the experiments in the big pine forests that these lemurs live in. But we were able to do a couple of mini rapid cognitive tests, co uh, rapid assessments inside the indoor enclosures and, um, oh well, that's the nature of zoo research and I did get a very nice trip to Florida out of it. So here's just a picture of um, one of the experiments that we tried to do indoors with the Florida lemurs um, on multiple different groups of different sizes, different social structures, which was really interesting to do a comparison between them. And it's a cone flipping task, so it's just like the advent calendar, but instead of being vertical, it's laid flat. And that works fine because ring-tailed lemurs are a very adaptable species. They are just as comfortable on the ground as they are um, foraging up a little bit higher. So it actually worked quite well. Um, and I think what this shows is that similar to my other enrichment devices so far, modular setups where you can scale up or scale down the size of what you have to fit the enclosure size, to fit the animal size, and to fit the level of complexity that you're aiming for is definitely the way forwards. So in conclusion, can we train the brains of zoo animals? Um, I hope that I've shown you in this relatively quick whistle stop tour of zoo research that we can and brain training can take many forms. Um, challenging the evolved cognitive skills of animals is essentially what brain training is and whether that's a game designed for enrichment purposes um, or a piece of experimental apparatus we can even combine both aims so we could design something that is primarily a type of enrichment, but we can also collect some interesting cognitive data from it, or we can design a cognitive task apparatus that appears to be very engaging and motivating. So I think that by undertaking ABC research in zoos, we can help animals lead a more meaningful, fulfilled and challenged life. And I hope that if you work in a zoo or if you are planning on studying in a zoo, some of this might be inspiring to you. I'd like to give thanks to so many people that work with me on these projects, all of these lovely folk, um, and many of whom I continue to work with at my zoos and further afield. And this brings this brings an end to my talk. Um, and I wish everyone the best of health at these um, difficult times. And I look forward to hearing your questions. So I have a question from Claire Pitts, and I'll just read it out to you. Culture is widely uh, recognised in primates. If the apparatus, especially for gorillas, was distributed to other exhibits, would you expect there to be variation in the use of these apparatus, and could it be used to research primate culture? Yeah, for sure. So one of the... Um big benefits of the Gorilla Game Lab device is actually um, the plans are available open source. So if you, um, if anyone wanted to contact me and they have um, gorillas at their facility or access to gorillas, um, the plans can be downloaded and taken to um, your local woodwork shop and they can actually um, print out the bits of wood and slot it together and because of that we've got identical copies theoretically of this device that we can test on lots and lots of different gorilla populations so for sure we could um, do quite a large multi-institutional study and compare um, the performance of gorillas across um, different zoos and maybe um, a sanctuary comparison would be really nice I would love to look at um, how gorillas um, that maybe have a lower baseline level of welfare um, respond to this device, whereas um, the gorillas at Br Bristol Zoo have a very good welfare state anyway, and then you add this on top. So I'd love to see um, if animals that are maybe from a more deprived environment um, react more strongly, perhaps. 
Um, but in terms of maybe studying culture and getting really psychological with it, I think we just have to be a bit wary in a zoo setting where it's not your main aim to see how skills transmit. So maybe if you were looking to do a social learning study, that might not work so well in the type of setting that I usually do my experiments where you test a group because you can't really be sure who, which member of the group is watching another member and learning from them as opposed to actually directly solving the problem and, and working it out themselves. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Claire. Thank you very much, Fabe. We have quite a few good questions coming in. So let's take a few more. Um, a question from Bob. Do you think that current knowledge on human psychology can be used to better understand the cognition and mental well-being of primates? Um, I think actually traditionally that has been the traditional approach. So we, um, if you're a sort of more old school person in, in this field, you probably will be using human psychology already. And actually, I would say that the opposite might be more useful now and maybe we should be switching less from human psychology and more towards animal psychology in its own right. Um, because I think human animal comparisons have a limit and you get to the point where uh, it's not useful to compare them as much as maybe we did um, a couple of decades ago. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a question from Alexander. Why do you think animals seek challenge? And is there a difference in this behavior between wild and captive animals? Um, so I'm not too familiar with the wild animal literature, I'll be honest, um, but in the captive literature, so yes, animals do seek challenge. I think the reason for that is because it's, um, it's an inherent need to be to be responsive to challenge so it's something that's in an animal and just because it's in captivity as opposed to the wild that urge and that motivation and that need to go off and solve problems for yourself is still there and it, it as it, as has been shown in lots of different animals it's still there even when animals are given food for free and they have thermal comfort and they you know they don't need to find nesting materials because it's provided to them they still have that within them and that is again tied into this idea that i'm really passionate about that these cognitive skills um, should be conserved even in captive animals that don't necessarily need to exercise them as strongly as wild animals do if we're thinking about reintroducing animals from zoos eventually maybe not tomorrow but maybe in a decade in two decades it's really important that we help animals hold on to these skills um, and these abilities to solve problems thanks Faye do you have time to maybe answer one more question sure go for it and then um anybody who has a question that doesn't get answered right now um perhaps if you could send us an email um we'll take a record of all these questions and i'm happy to pass them on to Faye, or you're more than welcome to to contact Faye directly if that's all right with you Faye. yes okay so last question here we go a fun one um emma asks can you see projects similar to this being designed to suit rhinos in captivity Designing enrichment items strong enough for them has proven to be challenging. Yes, it has. Um, so I do have colleagues that I could give a shout out to um, who work at San Francisco Zoo, um, who actually developed um, a cognitive enrichment uh, device for rhinos, or it was one rhino, I believe. And it was a, a remote controlled feeder ball. So um, the, the researchers could actually control this uh, ball moving around in the rhino's enclosure using their mobile phones. Um, so that's kind of tying in with my dolphin story and the importance of movement. Um, so rather than just having an animal stationary, um, having it move around. And for something like a rhino, which is either going to be a, a browser or a grazer, movement is important to an animal like that. Um, so tying in the element of movement into cognitive challenges. Um, for a large ungulate, I think is is the way forward. Fantastic! Um, thank you very much again, indeed. That was <laughs> that was fantastic. Okay, so I am now just going to 
share the screen for the next talk, which is where? Da, 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 da. There we go. Give me just a second. So um, thank you everybody for joining us again. Thank you for your patience. Um, just letting you know that the next Bristol Zoo Conservation Talk is going to be the Halloween special. It's going to be horror stories from the field. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk. Giving a talk. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Abrahams. And this is going to be a talk which is going to include lots of gory imagery, lots of nasty things that might... Um, might make you squirm and therefore we're going to change the time so I know it says six until seven on this slide but we're actually going to move it to an hour later so we're going to have it seven till eight so that at least you get to eat something first and we don't put you off your dinner for your Halloween talk. Um, so thank you all very much indeed uh, it's been lovely having you and I shall see you for the next talk.